I'm going to try to give you like a general overview of this event. It's going to seem like a lot, but everything I'm about to say, I'm going to go into more detail in later. So in this event, your kids are going to get a theoretical crime scene. That's why it's called Crime Busters. Crime scene is also going to be PG, so don't worry about that. They get evidence that comes in four parts. Part one is powders. Part two is ink. Part three is fingerprints, footprints, and tire prints. Something I did change from last year. Um, it's footprints instead of just shoe prints, so it could be a barefoot, if you remember that from last year. And something I should mention now is if I say that I changed something from last year, it's probably not mentioned on this handout. So if you coach less, you, you might want to make notes of that stuff. Um, part four evidence is called unspecified evidence. That's something that the kids will not know about beforehand. It's going to be, it'll test their critical thinking skills. We'll get to it in a little bit. But the first most important thing is lab safety. We had a few issues with this last year. During the test, the students have to wear splash-proof safety goggles, things you do use in chemistry. There should be like no space between their face and the goggles, because there are chemicals they deal with that they get in their eyes. It's not good. But um, they have to be worn during the entire test, and you can't take them off at all. Um, there's risk of disqualification for that. We do give warnings. We're not too mean, but just make sure you take that seriously. You should probably when you're practicing with your kids, make sure they're always wearing safety goggles. That way it's not a big deal when they go to the test. And of course, you can't touch, taste, feel, or sniff any of the chemicals or powders that I give you during the test. Um, okay, and something else is supplies that the kids can bring. This is in the rules, so it's not in the handout I'm talking about, but it's in the rules. The kids are allowed to bring a magnifying glass into the event. They should definitely bring pencils. They have to be able to work with a Scantron, so number two, or I think mechanical pencils like HB works with Scantrons. Um, they can bring a cheat sheet too that's eight and a half by 11 front and back. Both sides? Both sides. You have to just make sure it's this size and you should not have a problem. Um, that was a lot of information really fast, but now we're going to go into part one of the test. It's about powders. The main thing for the powders is you have to know how to tell apart ten different common kitchen powders. I can list them for you right now. They're powdered <coughs> Alka-Seltzer, baking soda, cornstarch, flour, gelatin, granulated sugar, light brown sugar, and it's light brown sugar. I know there's two different kinds of brown sugar. That's new from last year, if you coached last year. There's salt, there's white cornmeal, and there's yellow cornmeal. And all of those are online in the rules and on this handout. So don't stress out if you miss something there. Um, and your kids are also going to get that on the test, the list of the powders that they can have. So once you're able to tell apart these powders when you go to practice them, you should consider their characteristics like, um, if you look at them with a magnifying glass, they all look different up close, so that will help you figure out this look, it looks like salt, this looks like sugar, this looks like gelatin. Those are all pretty easy to tell up close. Um, you should look at them on black paper. That kind of gives them some contrast. And you're also, on the test, going to get water, vinegar, and iodine to add to the powders. And just try that at home. The different powders have different reactions with those things. Um, and the last thing you can look at is you can test their texture if you poke them with a toothpick. Students will be provided toothpicks, spoons, black paper, extra plastic cups so that they can split up their powder samples, all that. That's all in the rules too, by the way. Um, so yeah, to, and when you're practicing, you should start with this probably because this takes the longest to get used to to learn. You should experiment on all of the powders and make a table listing what every powder does with every different reaction, all of that. And you can put that on your cheat sheet and bring it into the test and it should help you out. Um, yeah, so students get six plastic cups on the test. One's labeled one. Those are the powders that came from the crime scene. So you have to match cup one to one of the other five cups, A, B, C, T, E. 
A, B, C, D, and E are from suspects A, 3. So each suspect has a couple of powders that they recovered from them. And yeah, the cup will match exactly. There'll be the same powders in there. There'll be one, two, or three powders in each cup. But one more thing is last year I was a little unclear about this, but there are a couple of combinations of powders that will never be in the same cup because it's impossible to tell them apart when they're together. Baking soda and Alka-Seltzer, I'm not going to put in the same cup. And cornstarch and flour, that's also a little too tough, so I won't put those together. Part two is called chromatography. Chromatography is what forensic scientists use to tell ink samples apart. You can imagine this as a piece of chromatography paper. If you touch the edge of this to rubbing alcohol, the rubbing alcohol travels up the paper and these are ink samples. They spread out along the paper and make a design that's unique for each different type of pen or marker that you use. So if this was on your test and you did the experiment, you could see that two and B match up, so you would implicate suspect B. I mean, this isn't really what they look like because I just drew that with marker, but it's, it's the same idea. Um, the paper is going to be five centimeters by 10 centimeters. There are a couple videos and the kit insert on the event website will help you with this because this is pretty complicated, but definitely help you out if you look on that. It's a, a perfect video from the workshop last year that will get you all up to speed and we're not changing the method of doing it at all. Part three is for fingerprints, footprints, and tire prints. Just pretty straightforward. I give the kids a sample of fingerprints, footprints, and tire prints from the crime scene and from each of the suspects, and they have to match up which suspects match up to that. And again, each part of the test can be, can implicate one or two suspects. So if I give you a fingerprint from the crime scene, it's probably going to only match one suspect because that makes sense. But a tire print could match more than one suspect, a footprint could match more than one suspect. Anything that allows you to be able to match it. I think fingerprints, one of the weird things I did last year was I gave you alien fingerprints, so they didn't look like human fingerprints, but they were still fingerprints, so you can match them up. But yeah, so I think this is one of the more fun events, especially if you get creative with it. Um, part four is the scary part of the test. The kids will not know what is going on when they come in. But the format will be the same as everything else. You get one thing from the crime scene, and you get one thing from each suspect. You have to match it up. Um, there are examples of this in the event rules that you can look at. There are also the uh, types of evidence that I used on the test last year. I think at the district tournaments, I gave them a, like a time log of when all the employees punched in and out, yeah, and they had to figure out. Laughter. Yes, so they had to figure out which employees were in the building at the time of the crime. And at the county tournament, what did I give them? I gave them chemicals that they could test the pH of. Yes. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, they just had to match up the pH. I gave them color changing paper that matched up to each. So after you do part one, two, three, and four in no particular order, you have a suspect or two identified for each of the parts, right? You matched up each of these pieces of evidence to either one or two suspects. So there's a part five of the test where you just decide, okay, after all this, who did the crime, who committed the crime? So that's a pretty easy part of the test, but it is worth just as much as these two parts. When it comes to scoring, part one is worth the most points. Part two is worth the second most points. And part three, four, and five will be less than part two, but they'll be about the same. I think I made them around 15 or 12 last year. The test is total out of 100 points. Uh, in the rules, there's going to be more information on all the scoring stuff, so make sure you check out the rules for sure. And I should remind you that any team that violates the lab safety rules is at risk of being disqualified. That's probably the most important part of the event, and definitely the one that the kids struggle the most with because they always wanted to take their goggles off and they were really restless about that. So make sure you practice that. And 
again, link is there with all the study material from last year, and I'm planning on adding a little bit more this year. I'm probably going to add bare footprints to the study material. Um, I know there's a lot going on, especially for you new coaches, and it's kind of hard to explain all of this in a half hour, but if you go online and look at the Crime Busters kit insert, which is also online, that will definitely get you started with this event. So just look at that. It feels the last part that's different from last year as we added scantrons in. I think last year we just gave you an answer sheet where you circled things and we made it a little bit easier this year. The Scantron's only going to have five questions on it. It'll match to part one, two, three, four, five. And that's why you'll notice we changed it to one, two, three, four, five. So they're question numbers instead of letters. And then for each of the questions on the Scantron, we'll just put the suspects that they're implicating. So the only written part of the test will be when you have to identify these powders. It hopefully won't get too confusing for the kids, but it'll definitely make it faster for us, which is helpful. Um, there's help with scantrons on the macombso.org website if you need help using those. You know, you have to fill in the squares all the way and all that. Make sure you've experienced that before. And there may be two, one or two. Maybe one or two that will be scored properly according to that. And if there's an extra suspect filled in, you also get half points off, which is mentioned in the rules. That's what we did last year. I didn't really decide that until the time of the tournament, so I made it an official rule this year. But, yes. Did you say for part five where they tell you which suspect it is that is on the Scantron too? It's not written on the bottom of the sheet anymore? Right, yes. It's You just have to pick the suspect letter, so part five is also on the Scantron. Okay. Yes. Will you be doing the workshop again? I will not be doing the workshop this year. The head coaches of each team voted, and I think Crime Busters came in third place, so it's just out of reach of having another workshop. Okay. But yeah, there's still videos from the workshop last okay. year online, so check that out if you need a refresher. Um, any more questions? Yes. The uh, the eight and a half by eleven cheat sheet. Does that have to be handwritten, or can there be portions that are typed? The eight and a half by eleven cheat sheet can be typed, handwritten. You can tape things onto it as long as I can tell it's all just a flat piece of paper. Right. Just yeah, we'll check it out. It will. There's no real restrictions on that as long as it's the right size. You can laminate it. Yes. Yep. And we also recommend that you try making a note card because we found that the kids got really overwhelmed trying to use a full sheet of paper like with a whole chart of all the reactions. Sometimes it got a little too much from the check back and forth on it when really they can just memorize how to identify all the powders. So, and we might eventually make the rule that you only get an index card just just a hint for the future. It might help you out. <laughs> we aren't sure about that, but it, it was discussed. So you're saying create the sheet and then have to back up with the index card or create some more on the sheet? Um, I would say you can make both, see how the kids do with the full sheet, and maybe try using an index card. They can't be together, it can only gotcha. be one or the other. Because your cheat sheet can be smaller than 8.5 by 11, too. But that might help your kids not trip over having this whole sheet of information because sometimes they had information on their cheat sheets that was totally irrelevant to what I was asking. So it might help you out if you use something smaller. Like the different, the different kinds of pens, are they going to be obvious, or would would there be a case where there could be like a um, like two different brands of the same type of ballpoint pen? Will they will they show different um, reactions? It's obvious. Yes. Yeah, you'll it'll it'll know. you'll know. For the chromatography, okay. if it's a different <coughs> pen at all, it will look different. Okay. So gel it, pens don't work. Yeah, and I always, I always test the chromatography myself to make sure it's easy enough for them to get, so right. don't worry. Okay. Yes? I have two questions. Uh, as far as the scantron goes, you said they might not do it in this order, but I would assume number one is always number one, number not three. their first station. So they need to be able to say, like, whoops, we were on number three first, let's look at number three. Exactly, good point. For the scantron, number one will always be part one, number two is part two. Make sure the kids keep it all in order, even though they may not do the test in the same order. I actually recommend them starting with part two and getting the chromatography set up first 
because it takes a few minutes for it to for you to be able to tell apart the designs. I think at the workshop I gave them ten minutes. That's a little overkill, but you know. And another note about time that is not on this handout is the kids will always get exactly 25 minutes to complete the test. Time slot's 30 minutes, but I need time to get them set up and make announcements, so I figured if I limit them to exactly 25 minutes, it's fair for everyone. So, so basically we're saying five minutes per. Yeah, you could do that. Some of the parts do take longer than others, like part five is not going to take you five minutes. I probably more like six parts. Yeah, so it's all depending on how the kids work together. You can even split up the test if you want. So just experiment with how you want to complete the test. I'd say part one is going to take you the most time. But part two needs to be set up too because sometimes kids get really flustered with that and they forget about it. Some of the materials in the kit you don't run out of because it's like a magnifying glass it comes with. Right. I might recommend getting the, I think it's called the replenishment kit. It comes with a set of powders, the new powders for this year, and the chromatography paper because they might have used that up from last year. Mm -hmm. But, yes, I'm not bucks. sure. They, yeah, it's only 10 bucks too. It's really the nice. Kit, yeah, it's 10. Yeah, it's the whole know. kit's 30. Yeah, so <laughs> as long as those didn't sell out, I'm sure we'll be taking orders for them in the future from the Wayne Oakland team, so I'm not sure if Macomb is included on that, but definitely go check out the table and see what's going on. And if you need, if you have any questions about what materials there are, there's an FAQ page on the event page where you can ask me questions directly. I will recommend sources for you. I can put, I can put a link directly on the website if you ask me of where I get my chromatography paper. Well, you know, you know, you um, on the Scantron, the answer will be one or two suspects always, because for each part of the test, they're going to identify one or two suspects. For number five, that's when they get to eliminating suspects, and they might get it down to one, or they might have it down to two. Because, like, for example, for part one, I could implicate suspect A, part two, I could implicate A, B, part three, I could implicate B, part four, I could implicate D, like, D was only implicated for one part, so they're probably not going to be okay, criminal. So an answer could be correctly two suspects. Exactly. Okay. Yes. I don't think last year I made any that were two suspects in the end. I know I, I made individual parts of the test that had two suspects, but I don't think I went that far yet. But that might happen this year. Who knows? <laughs> um, yeah, so when it comes to eliminating the suspects, that all happens at the end once you look at your individual parts. When you say implicating two suspects, like for the powders, does that mean like cup A could have three powders, two of them match number one, and then B has two, three powders, and one of them matches number one, so they could be both implicated? That's a good question. Actually, the cups will only match if they have the exact same powders in them. So you only implicate so, if it has all three powders, for example? Yeah, all three are the same, or all two are the same. There won't be a different number of powders in the two. They'll be the exact same thing. Yes, for the powder part, you also you have to examine each of the six cups and identify the powders in them, or one powder can be one, two, or three powders. So even if they identify cup E has all three matching powders, you still need them to do A, B, C, D? 
Yes. Even though they know E is the century. They actually get most of the points for identifying the powders in each of the cups. Okay. The um, implication at the end is the least amount of points for the whole part. So the cups have all the powders in them, they stir it, pour it out, or just um, pour it out? Or yeah, the cup it? comes with the three powders mixed together, mm -hmm. and what I recommend is they pour a little bit out into a different cup, because it gives them a bunch of extra plastic cups. Mm -hmm. That way, if they're doing the test, they don't waste all of their cup on one test. But they also get spoons, they get toothpicks, they get all sorts of tools to move them around. And they don't have to stress out too much about if they accidentally touch the powders. Like, I know it's going to be really difficult since it's a messy event, but I don't want them purposely going out of their way to feel all the powders. Yes? Will we have to practice with the chromatography paper so they can recognize what sort of pattern shows up for the specific thing? Um, No, I won't like ask them like, what kind of ink is this? They just have to be able to match the patterns that do come. So, if they just have mm -hmm. to know that they look the same. They don't have to know that, oh, this is a marker, so it's going to look like this. It's just whatever comes out of there, they have to match them up. Does that make sense? So they have to know how much alcohol to pour into the cup. Is that mm -hmm. what you're saying for the paper for them to set it up, or is that pre-set up for That's them? That's pre-set up for them. So Come they up. just have to put the dip the paper in it? Just have to dip it in. And last year we gave them like a stirring stick to put through a hole in the top of the paper, and they kind of just set it on top of the cup, and it was really easy. Okay. Not too big of a deal, as long as they put it straight down in, mm -hmm. and they didn't put it too far in, which wasn't usually a problem, then they were fine. Just to be clear, the kids need, absolutely need, to bring in the safety goggles, splash proof, they can't be the glasses kind, they have to be goggles. They kind of look like the ones you swim in, but they're not the same. Um, I think last year I posted a source where you can get them from online, I'm not sure if that's still there, but if it's not, ask me and I'll put up another one. Um, so that's the only thing that's required for the kids to bring in. Kids will also need pencils, of course, but we're not going to not let them in the room if they don't bring in pencils. That's their problem, I guess. <laughs> but um, they're going to want to bring in pencils. They can bring in a magnifying glass for each student, so you can have a total of two magnifying glasses. Restrictions on that are very limited. It just can't have, it can't plug into the wall is my main requirement. It can't be like a microscope or something. It has to be a handheld object that can magnify, and that's all it does. Um, students can bring them in, it's not required. Students can bring in one cheat sheet for the whole team, not two. And I think that's all I'm asking them to bring. They're, they're provided everything else for the test.